Good morning and welcome back to our Bible study. We're starting to step into chapter 2 of Revelations, where chapters 2 and 3 are that, the, the, the seven letters to the churches. And remember, we talked about the seven lampstands, and so the churches, again, are the same ones. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And each one of them um, is is recorded as a, a message that came from Jesus through John for these congregations. And, and again, with each and every one of them, just like when you read through Paul's letters, for example, there's things that are praiseworthy within the congregations and then there are problems. And as we listen to this, it's a reminder that as we look at ourselves um, and our own congregations, there are the same sorts of dynamics there as well. The Holy Spirit does his work, but then our own human stubbornness gets in the way. So the best way as we read through the scriptures in general, but especially this section here of the book of Revelation, is to use it not so much as a set of spectacles or glasses to take a look at other people, but instead to take a look at ourselves, so that as we hear the words of Jesus being spoken to the early church through John, that we allow the same words to speak to us today. And so let's begin with an opening word of prayer. We'll see how far we make it through these letters. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this, this day, and we ask your blessing even in our own time of struggle and upheaval within the world. And even as we take a look inside of our own hearts and within our own congregations, the ways in which we continue to wrestle and struggle between those, those cultural currents that always try to pull us away from the simple word of truth that you've given to us in the scriptures in order to follow the latest trends that are there. Bless us so that as we are strengthened through that word that we would learn not to seek the approval of, of the people around us, but also not to be cruel towards others, but rather to live in humility before you and before the world so that we would learn to be your people and reflect your love and your care within this world as that body of Christ, as Paul writes. This we pray in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. All right. So as we jump into chapter 2, the first letter goes to the city of Ephesus. And Ephesus, um, we know it already from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. There was a vibrant Christian community there, and this is one of those passages or one of those places where Paul preached the simple gospel message that we are saved by grace through faith, not of works, so that no one can boast. And not so that we can go and jump into sin all the more so that, you know, God's grace can abound. That's an echo from Romans, but at the same time in Ephesus and all the other places within the early church, they sometimes wrestled with that balance between the law and the gospel, the gospel as a gift and the law as as God's instruction on how we were created to live. Well, as we look at the, the church in Ephesus, and we'll read through the letter and then we'll start to comment here, um, we find that, that um, again, there's words of praise, but also words of warning. So to the angel or the messenger, likely the pastor of the church in Ephesus, and this is the way the verse starts in chapter 2, um, the voice Jesus says, right. He says, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand. Again, referring to the whole church um, and the way in which we saw from, from last week's study. Seven being a number of completion. So the whole church on this side of eternity, Jesus holds the whole church in his hand. And he's the one that walks among the seven golden lampstands. And so again, Jesus' presence within the church. He says, I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance, and I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered, and I have endured hardship for my name, or sorry, and you have, and you have persevered and have endured hardship for my name, and have not grown weary. And so that's the first part. So there's words of praise here that come from our Lord to the church in Ephesus at that time, where he recognizes that they were zealous in doing good deeds and doing good works, loving their neighbors as Christ has loved us, living in the humility of forgiveness, not only before God, but then also before one another and before the world. Also, not tolerating wicked men, 
Okay? And as we read through the New Testament, that can be not only people who are morally wicked, but then also people who come in as teachers of a different gospel. We find that throughout, well, Peter, throughout Jude, we find that in Paul as well. And John even speaks about the same things in his own letters to the churches, where he reminds people that we ought to be cautious, that we don't just follow any preacher that claims the name of Jesus somewhere along the way without testing them. And here he praises the Ephesians that they did precisely that. So basically he says that you have tested those who claim to be apostles, basically those who claim to be authentic preachers of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but he says are not, and have found them false. Um, it's a recognition that this whole struggle with, with many different preachers and even false preachers as we find them in the world, um, that that existed right there in the early church at the end of the first century already and even earlier. We find those reminders throughout each and every one of the letters as we find them within the New Testament. So that there's always that call to return back to Scripture and back to the authentic word. And yes, originally in the church that was, well, considered to be the Old Testament in the way that Paul and the other apostles wrote about it. But at the same time as the church grew and the apostles, well, were martyred and as the church, well, basically pieced together, how do we maintain this life and this lively remembrance of the eyewitnesses? You had the gospel accounts that were written by the apostles, as well as the letters by the chief apostles that were gathered and collected together as part of that scripture as well. So that the New Testament, as we have it today, far from being an invention of many, many years afterwards, true, there were a couple of other writings that were highly honored and were often circulated together with the New Testament, but, but um, they were excluded not on the basis of them being inauthentic or bad reading, but simply because they didn't have an apostle as an author. So as we look at these words, there's this reminder, not only to the church of Ephesus, but even for us today, that we need to be well-rooted and grounded in what is authentically taught from the apostles, from the time of Christ, and to persevere within that rather than following false preachers. It's nothing new under the sun, the way Ecclesiastes writes. Here, as Jesus speaks to them, he says, You have persevered and have endured hardship for my name and have not grown weary. And it points to the reality that sticking with the authentic testimony that comes through the word, well, sometimes it does face challenges. And we'll run into some of those along the way with some of the other cities and the churches that were there. Yet, he goes on in verse 4, I hold this against you. Those are some of those words that sort of make you shudder to your boots. And, uh, you know, as you think about it, this is being the Lord speaking through John, it's not the kind of word that you would want to hear from God. But it's a sobering reminder, even in our own world, the way in which we sometimes, <coughs> well, we think too highly of ourselves. We think we're doing everything perfect because we've done it the way it was always done, at least as far back as we can remember. Um, we don't take the time often, though, to dig into the scriptures and to test whether what is being done is the best for our circumstances today. And that's not to throw doctrine out the window, not by any means, but to recognize that as Christians, we live in a changing world. And along the way, we do need to adjust how we relate with wisdom to the circumstances around us, not only for mission and those purposes, but even as we look at evangelizing our own hearts, the hearts and lives of our own children. So here Jesus says, I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Goodness. What could he be talking about? Well, I'm reminded the way that Paul, writing to the Galatians, well, he came down on them in the same kind of a way and says, who has bewitched you? to move you away from the simple gospel and the truth of salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone to chase after some other doctrine or some other gospel, which is no gospel at all. It's very much the same message that we find here. In our zeal to do good works, sometimes we can get so caught up in pursuing those works, thinking that we're doing such a great job that we overlook the simple truth 
the simple reality that we are saved not by our works, but by Christ himself. And I believe this is part of what's going on here. So I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen. And this is why. Because as we listen to these words, again, John continues with these words from Christ where he says, Repent and do the things you did at first. And if not, or if you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Now, this is the same John <coughs> who wrote to the churches in his first letter, and we know this from our, our communion service very well as we prepare to confess our sins. He begins that letter by reminding his readers in his letters in the same thing. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. John builds the whole of that letter around the simple call to confess our sins, to live in that repentance, and to lean on Christ, who comes and redeems us through his blood, his body, through the waters of baptism, all of those things in the way in which he writes that particular letter that he keeps talking about. And so this call to repentance is simply a call back to that humility to rely on Christ rather than rely on themselves. Those words should strike us as very important, especially for our own day and age too, where it's very easy for us to get caught up within, well, different social justice movements within the world, and not that social justice isn't a worthy cause. But Sometimes we substitute the anger or the fear or the, the momentum we can build around a particular cause as righteousness rather than leaning on Christ and building on his word. Certainly there are things in the world that always need to be addressed from one generation to the next, but our anger does not shift or move that. Only the Spirit of God can change that. And he does that first and foremost, not by making us look at ourselves as being more righteous than others who hold a different view, but instead by reminding us that before God and before one another, we are all broken. And the only thing that brings us together, not only with our Savior Jesus Christ, so that we have that open door to heaven, but then with one another too, is that humility of repentance tied to the gift and the giving and celebrating and sharing of forgiveness. Verse 6, continuing on. Oh, and, and it just as he went on, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. That's a sobering reminder. No church, or at least congregation, is eternal. Um, no denomination is eternal. If we lose our way along the way and separate ourselves from God's word as the anchor, the source, and the norm of what it is that Christ taught to us and the apostles give to us. Here is this very stark warning that Jesus will simply remove the lampstand from its place. He'll basically just let the church or that particular group um, go its own way and no longer view it as, a, as an authentic church. That's something that especially in our world today, as people wrestle and struggle with how do we address all these modern concerns that, you know, cultural theory is built on and all of the things within our society is built on. Um, it's that call again to be anchored in Scripture rather than simply trying to turn things around and, and make, make, you know, change the morality of the God's Word because it just hasn't seemed to fit within our modern world. Nowhere has the church done that. And the places that they have actually have caused problems along the way. Verse 6, though. But you have this in your favor, Jesus says. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. And then he says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. No, so first of all, who are the Nicolaitans? Um, in the early church, there were, as we already found in the New Testament, a number of spin-off groups. And um, some of them were people like Simon Magus who wanted to be able to do the same things, you know, work the same miracles that the apostles did. And so he tried to buy the ability from the apostles and all along the way. 
Um, there's, there's a number of other groups that early church historians identify, and some of them are simply identified by their leader, and others are lumped together as just this very broad kind of a movement where they would get along with one another, but at the same time they would each have their own particular twist on the teachings. Um, the Nicolaitans, and we'll find them echoed throughout the rest of these, these letters to the, the early churches here in, in chapters 2 and 3, were um, representative of a movement, and you know some people tried to try to anchor the the um, preacher of that church to Nicholas, one of the the initial deacons from from Acts. Um, that's that's not certain in any any way, shape, or form. But this particular group, they like to kind of um, blur the boundary between scripture and culture, very much in the same way in which many liberal churches do today, where you take you know, what's popular in culture and people's hang-ups from culture <clears throat> and people's, um, you know, struggles with with maybe some of the very specific statements of Scripture and basically say, well, maybe those parts aren't really meant to be followed that seriously. And then they kind of mix it all together so that it's like a, a cat's breakfast, you know, where you, you have a little bit of that, a little bit of this, and then in the end you have something that's totally different from what is preached and taught in, in the scriptures. Um, here, both the Ephesians did have that in their favor. They recognized that, they, that these Nicolaitans had stepped away from the pattern of sound doctrine, the way that, that Paul describes it. And, and basically... Um, you know, Jesus here says, I also hate them, using it in a good biblical sense where there is um, hate being the term for preference, strong preference for, or strong preference against. And um, to hear that word from Jesus' mouth is an important one because, you know, far too often in our liberal world, we see Jesus simply as this loving God who, who doesn't have any judgment at all within his heart. And certainly in Christ, as we come to him in repentance, there is always that forgiveness because that is the promised guarantee. But it's not a promise so that we can do whatever. And this is what this particular passage reminds us and tells us about. And then, of course, he ends the letter with that <coughs> wonderful way of saying that he who has an ear, or whoever has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So the Spirit speaks through the Word, and very much in the same way that Luther insisted that it is through the ear, in the way that we heard last Sunday in church, also with the, with our Romans reading, um, that, that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of Christ, which is the Word of God, as he explains and unfolds it, that Word of forgiveness and grace. Um, we need to sharpen our ears to hear that. And then to him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Both a reference to the tree of life that we'll see here within the book of Revelation, but historically always understood as not only the life-giving tree, cross, and basically the tree of the cross, where we receive the fruits of that tree, the body and blood of Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins, but recognizing that this is that tree from the original Garden of Eden as well, where God does give us eternal life. So that's the letter to the Ephesians. Ephesus, um, again, was, was a major city within modern-day Turkey um, and uh, was considered to be the major imperial city in that area. And so it would make natural sense to begin there. Moving on to the second city, though. Um, the town of Smyrna, okay. and Smyrna is known um, where they were always very close to try and follow in what the, the emperor, the Caesar's um, demands and requests were, and so Smyrna was one of these towns where it was known that there was both a very strong um, worship of the emperor, especially during this time where Dalmatian um, was, was trying to 
counter Christianity as well as other um, religious movements by setting himself self up as a leader, um, as a, a a king, and, and as a god over over the nation. And so you had all that whole practice where where people and Christians simply refused to do that pinch of offering um, to say Caesar is Lord. And so basically to say that. Um, that Caesar is a, a god like the pharaohs consider themselves gods here on earth and, and for this many Christians ended up being put to death um, th this is one of those cities that became a very important place for persecutions against Christians not only from the Roman side but then also from from a large and hostile Jewish community which was trying to distance itself from these Christians because well, the Jews were exempt from making those sorts of offerings and here the Christians who the Jews didn't really accept as their own at this point in time but still were associated with them it started to create an internal conflict moving along. Um, also Smyrna um, is also the, the site from where a, a famous bishop of the early church in the early early 100s um, his name is Polycarp and um, he was martyred for uh, burnt at the stake and, and his martyrdom account is, is, is well known and uh, would be neat looking at at some point in time as well. But uh, Polycarp was was a bishop um, trained likely by the Apostle John and ordained by him and uh, who was martyred for the name of Jesus from that city. So what does Jesus say to the angel, the messenger, the pastor of the church in Smyrna? He says, right. These are the words of him who was first and last, who died and came to life again. Okay, so the eternal Jesus, like we say in the Nicene Creed, um, God of God, light of light, God, uh, very God of very God, begotten, not made, eternally begotten of the Father. So there's no time in which Jesus did not exist. So first and last, tying him to the Alpha and the Omega, um, the beginning and the end, and so, um, and again, going back to that rabbinic commentary from this time period, um, where they were commenting on why does the book of Genesis begin with the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet? Well, it's to remind us that the beginnings of the book, or the beginnings of the whole of Scripture, are rooted in the silent Aleph, the, or the equivalent of A, the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, which is the first letter in the name for God, El or Elohim. Um, so to show that it's in silence, that uh, the silence before the speaking which created the world, which likewise created God's word, um, that, that Jesus is already there. So these are the words of him who is the first and the last, and so that you don't confuse him with the Father or some other deity, one who died and who came to life again. And here, comforting the people in Smyrna. He says, I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. And we're not, not talking financial riches here. He's talking about a richness in faith. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Okay, keep it in context, because it's very easy to take a look at this in terms of, you know, postmodern anti-Semitism and say, see how horrible these Christians were and that they persecuted the Jewish community. Um, it was actually a statement where the tides were turned and the opposite was happening. The small Christian community was being persecuted by both Roman and, and uh, sources and leaders within the Jewish community. And here he refers to that community which is fighting against Christianity and against the gospel and against the name of Jesus as that synagogue, basically the community of Satan. All that is is simply the same thing that is expressed in other places where any preacher who comes preaching against Christ is an against Jesus preacher or an anti-Christ preacher. Okay. And here, as Jesus speaks these words to the church in Smyrna, it's a reminder and a reflection that this particular community of Christians was particularly hard hit by the public um, the persecution and pressures, much in the same way as we see around the world today and uh, we see brewing in parts of the U.S. and even in Canada where people have no issues with, with 
you know, demeaning Christians and, and uh, basically saying blasphemous things about our Savior. But here, Jesus in response says, do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you. So he's not sugarcoating it. Saying that, you know what, there will be difficulties where you will be, you know, afflicted, tormented, tempted by the devil, and even in ways where you're thrown into prison for my name's sake. And he says, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. So, now, here's an interesting question. Is that ten literal days, or is there a symbolic meaning behind that? Um, a lot of scholars will simply say, you know, there's a ten-day limit, meaning that Jesus has put an end to that suffering and persecution. And yet he says, be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. Listen to those words for a moment. You know, so often, especially with COVID, we become so frightened of death that we forget that Jesus is the one that has conquered death for us. And that the promise is, not on the basis of being good, not on the basis of some vague sort of a sense of just maybe, maybe it would be nice if God would do this, but because of the death and the resurrection of Jesus, which is how he begins this particular letter to the church, he says, those who remain faithful, basically trusting in that work of what I have done, the trusting of that word, where he says, come unto me, and be baptized, eat and drink my body and blood for the forgiveness of your sins. Don't give up gathering together, all of these sorts of things. He says, I will give you the crown of life, because led by that word, Jesus the word, the first and the last, that life becomes alive within us. So not even death can separate us from the love of God, and that really was the hope of the early Christians, which really confused people, and still does around the world today. Um, as, as Christians allowed themselves to be put to death, the apostles found it a joy, and even that Bishop Polycarp of Smyrna, where he had this wonderful statement where he was asked, you know, um, deny the atheists, basically. The Christians were called atheists because they didn't believe in the Roman gods and they didn't believe in the traditional gods. They preached Jesus and worshipped him as God. And, and Polycarp basically stood up in front of them all and waved to the whole crowd and says, away with the atheists, referring to them. And then after being pushed a little bit harder, um, he had that wonderful comment saying, it is not permissible for us to convert from the greater to the lesser. In other words, when you already have that crown of eternal life given and provided in the waters of baptism through Jesus Christ, why would we turn that away and to grab a hold of something lesser and lower? Those words of faith and hope, reflected even here, um, are good ones to take to heart, even in our own day. And then again, with verse 11, He who has an ear, Jesus says, let him hear. In other words, in the way Luther would turn that phrase around, and he does that with a good sense, got ears listen okay if you're not sure you're hearing it you know check check the side of your head if you've got ears then listen listen the word is for you it's not for other people it's for you and let's use it as a mirror for ourselves let him hear what the spirit says to the churches in other words these words are not only for Smyrna but for the whole church and again he who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death second death. Well, what's the second death? First death is when we die with Christ, when we're baptized together with him. Check it out, Paul, Romans chapter 6. So that the second death is our physical demise, where our eternal salvation and the promise of resurrection has already been secured. And so the second death, having already died with Christ in the waters of our baptism, is not anything that we need to fear, because just as surely as Christ is risen from the dead, and Paul being the one who researched that after his conversion experience, after being the one who tracked down Christians in order to stone them, 
And having talked to over 500 witnesses of the resurrection, he talks about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He says, you know, if only in this life we hope in Christ, you know, if it's only for this worldly things, you know, if you're only following a Jesus that promises you great riches and these sorts of things along the way, prosperity gospel stuff, then we are to be most pitied among people. But in fact, Paul says, Christ has been raised from the dead. And therefore, what we follow, what we preach, what we hope in, is far greater than any of the struggles and strife we might face in this world. I think we're going to have to stop there because we're hitting the 30-minute mark. So we'll pick up at verse 12 next week with the church in Pergamum, and then the church in Thyatira, and then we'll jump into chapter 3 with the three remaining churches as we as we move along. But again, as a reminder, um, good letters to reread, but use them as a mirror to look at yourself more than as a set of spectacles or, you know, perhaps more in the way, maybe a better way of talking about it, as binoculars to try and find the sins in other people's lives. Um, of course there's sin out there in the world. But when we take a look at the sins that we discover and that we notice along the way, it's far too easy for us to forget to see the sins that we ourselves carry and the brokenness that we stumble in. And so as we listen, um, let it be a mirror to yourself so that as we hear these words of Jesus, that we are called, like he says in that first letter to the Ephesians, back to him through repentance to that gift of grace so that we learn to rely on him rather than ourselves and our own understanding. May the peace of our Lord be with you. And then we'll tune in next week again with, with the next couple of letters and uh, we'll keep working our way through the book of Revelation. God's peace be with you all. Amen.